you don't have that many options when you're a refugee in Syria. You're given four typically. Option one, you stay, you die, or you watch a family member die. Option two, you leave and you die, just like that boy that washed the shore in Turkey. Option three, you stay and you live, but you end up just like that kid that ended up all over the news in the back of the ambulance. And option four, you leave, but you end up stuck in one of the refugee camps, not knowing where or what your future is going to hold. These are your four options as a citizen of Syria. Which one would you take? Everybody asked me, how was it? It's really hard to put five years of conflict into a few sentences, let alone three months of direct contact, but I'll try. Two in the morning, we had a woman who would always have these panic attacks. She also had severe depression after her son was killed in front of her. I went to see her, I calmed her down. After about an hour, I tried to, uh, to leave, and as soon as I turned around to walk away, her five-year-old son was screaming my name because she went for a rope and she tried to hang herself from a pole. This was just one of many examples um, that I witnessed. Another situation, we had a father, uh, he came up to me in the ambulance and he said, Mohammed, do you have poison on the ambulance? And uh, it really shook me, I didn't know how to respond. He said, uh, I just want to get rid of myself and my family because I'm sick of suffering. I'm sick of going through hard times and I'm sick of living like this. We've already suffered enough in Syria, he said. Uh, how do you respond to that? We forget that there are sick people there. We forget that there are people that need our help. We forget that people have suffered and they continue to suffer much more. One specific instance was a boy. He was given a day to days to live by some senior physicians. We got a kid that's five years old that's been told he has day, a day or days to live. So I'm awake right now, it's three in the morning and I'm just uh, watching him. It's been 47 days for me. This kid had been in the refugee camp for three months, not much help. He was one of the lucky ones. We got him out to Switzerland. Uh, he was lucky. He almost died on me on the plane. He needed oxygen the whole way uh, till we made it to Switzerland. And sadly, he's one of many stories. There are many kids that have uh, neuromuscular disorders. There are many children that have congenital heart defects. Um, there are many adults with chronic illnesses. And this is the problem. We forget that these are people just like you and I. Let me tell you how amazing some of these refugees are. One particular instance, our school was torn down because of the weather. A few days later, it was built again by amazing volunteers and refugees. More severe weather came in. One refugee would not allow the school to be torn down again. So he actually stood there at night, holding the poles together all night so the school wouldn't fall apart. This to me was just so selfless. This guy had absolutely nothing, and the only thing he can give was staying up all night, and he did. That's one of many examples. These guys and girls would get one apple a day, and they cut half of it for you, just to give to you. They would invite you over to their tents to have dinner. They would cook for you. They would take the jackets off of their back for you. There was one instance where it was pouring rain and I didn't have my jacket, I left it in Chicago. And one refugee took off his raincoat and he gave it to me. I wish people saw that side more than they see what's on the news and people trying to twist stories and making it seem like all the refugees are bad people. When people forget that these refugees were running away from war, if these people wanted to fight, they would have stayed in Syria.
how does it feel to know that we are shutting the door on these people? How does it feel to know that we are shutting our doors, the same doors that people opened up for us to come into this country? What can we do about it? What is our call to action? A lot of people ask me, Mohammed, what can we do to help these refugees? What can be done? Um, first and foremost, awareness. Share this video. Let people see what I've seen. Let people hear the stories that I have to tell you among the many other stories out there. Second, talk to your heads of state. Talk to your heads of government. What is their stance on the refugee crisis? What do they know about it? Uh, what have they done to help? Three, you can volunteer. There are so many amazing organizations out there like Syrian American Medical Society, just to name one, where you can work as an interpreter if you speak another language of need, doctor or nurse or a medic. There are many other organizations on the ground, and if you cannot go, you can at least donate. That's the least you can do. I promise you that some of these organizations are doing amazing work, and I've worked side by side with many of them. So that's what you can do. What happens when we don't take action? What happens when we don't do anything? What happens when we don't speak up? What happens when we are not the voice to the voiceless? More hospitals will continue to get bombed. More doctors and nurses will continue to get killed. More ambulances will continue to be targeted. More kids will continue to end up in the back of the ambulances. This is what happens when we don't take action. This will be something we will be ashamed of 50 and 60 years down the line when our grandkids ask us, about the Syrian crisis and what we did not do about it. This is our time now. This is our time to take action. This is when we need to speak up. This is when we need to be aware. This is when we need to be getting involved and being activists for this cause because I promise you there are so many stories out there. There are so many people suffering and if you can change one life, you've done well. Thank you.